It has to be the guiding force between all those, or for all the church leaders, the world one. That God has established, that God needs. This focus has to be on the soul. There are, they also must be geared towards goals, as we mentioned. They have to have the mentality of having goals not only in their own personal lives, but for the lives of those in the congregation to help mature the individual and the congregation as a whole. Those are not necessarily the same things, are they? You can help individuals grow mature and mature at different levels, but there's also the collective maturity that must be uh, taken under consideration. So those who are church leaders must be geared towards biblical goals. And lastly, we noticed how church leaders must be humbled by their roles. There is no place for those who uh, decide to lord over uh, the congregation, those who take that responsibility of leadership and use it as a platform to, to put one's thumb down on others. They must be humbled by their roles. It must be one of those things, as we've talked about many a times, and as we were talking about in our Sunday morning class in the terms, uh, the class about how do you handle inferiori inferiority, I, I immediately turned to Acts chapter uh, 17 and verse 10, where in, in essence we see that when we have done all that we are commanded, we are but servants, right? But humble servants. Whether we are considered elders, deacons, preachers, any church leader, whether it be song leader, whatever it is, we are but simple humble servants who are doing God's will. We must be humble as church leaders. All church leaders must be humble by their roles. And so that brings us to today. As I mentioned last week, we're going to move then into specific leadership roles. And we're going to start today by talking about preachers. We're going to look at preachers in particular. Of all the church leadership, from elders, deacons, preachers, of all the church leadership, song leaders, whatever we may talk about, whatever we may look at and and consider leadership within the church, all those areas, I am convinced that preaching, and preachers in particular, that's the least understood. Now, there's several reasons for this. First and foremost, preachers don't typically like preaching about preaching. It's one of those weird dynamics where you know what you're doing, you know what you're involved in, but, but preachers don't typically preach on preaching, do they? They might mention things like expectations of preachers uh, in a point here or there, but there's typically not sermons dedicated to the role of the preacher and things of this nature. And so for that reason, a lot of people don't understand. They recognize preachers as a leader to some capacity, but they don't understand preachers in and of themselves like they do elders and deacons where we have much more and many more sermons. As I look back, uh, from the time I've been here, which is now seven years, for some of you it seemed really quick, others a lot longer. As I look back, I realize that I hadn't had a single sermon on preaching and preachers. Now, like I said, several points here or there, thoughts throughout that time, but not a single sermon. And as you think about this, look at that's one of the reasons why preachers... There's so little understood concerning them and their roles. Secondly, people don't study preacher roles on their own either. It's one of those things where they talk about because of the interest, typically speaking. They, talk, they study elders and their roles, deacons and their roles, their leadership responsibilities, the things along this line. But typically speaking, when people go to study the Bible, they're not typically going to study about preaching and preachers. That's not one of those areas that people are going to spend a lot of time diving into. And it's because of this ignorance that we've seen a lot of damage done in the church. But because of a lot of misconceptions concerning the leadership role of a preacher. So much so that in many places, preachers have really been considered pastors like in the denominational world. They're not pastors. Pastors being shepherds or elders of the flock. But the role has morphed into that. And preachers are to blame for this just as much as everyone else, as I said. So as we get into this, and if you have your handout, you'll notice there's going to be two points, or two points only we're going to look at. 
The first one being preacher misconceptions or things that uh, people have throughout the years uh, that I've heard personally, that I have seen from or heard from other preachers that they have heard that, that are misconceptions about the preacher and his role. We're going to look at that first and then really the preacher role. And so if you have your hand out, let's go ahead and look at that first point, preacher misconceptions. The first misconception I want us to look at right here, and you've probably all heard this before, but in case you haven't also, that preachers are the, and I'm going to put that in quotations, preachers are the evangelists. What do I mean by that? There are a lot of people who think, well, they just put money into the collection as we just did to make for the preacher's salary so he can be in the community only doing the teaching. Now, obviously, not everyone feels that way or even acknowledges that truth. But a lot of people, whether they acknowledge that truth is right or wrong, they still lend themselves to that idea. Well, when you ask about well, what evangelistic effort have you been involved in lately in the community, well, isn't that your job? I can think of five times in particular when I have asked that question to others, thankfully never here, but to other people. I've asked, what is your evangelistic goal? What is the goal you have set for this year? Uh, what are you looking forward to doing? Well, isn't that what I put money in the collection for? You see, the big misconception is because we put money in there, some of that goes to support the preacher. We feel that, well, whether we like to admit it or not, or not a lot, a lot, we pay him to do that work. That's a major misconception. Now, some of this comes from a misconception of what Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 12 says. Let's go ahead and read that now. Ephesians 4, 11 through 12. And he, that's God, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for building up the body of Christ. They look at this and say, well, look, there's the evangelist there. God gave the evangelist. Preachers should be evangelists. And so when we support a preacher, they're that part of his title work. Now, it is true that the word evangelist here, which simply translates to proclaiming the gospel. That's all this word uh, literally means is proclaiming the gospel. I don't know where it got uh, the fancy title evangelist. But one who proclaims the gospel, it is true that a preacher is one who does that, right? Because preachers, when they preach the gospel, the gospel, or when they preach the word, they're preaching the gospel. As Paul said in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 5, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel. Now, we understand the foundation of the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. But inherent in that, obviously, and throughout, is the scriptures. And the scriptures are the good news. And so, in essence, every time a preacher preaches the gospel, he is an evangelist. Just like every time a teacher teaches the gospel, they are an evangelist. But when we look at the misconceptions that come, their misconception is that, well, look, that's a title somehow. These TV quote-unquote evangelists have really uh, spurred this misconception on that preachers somehow and in some way are paid to do the evangelism. This is, and couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, preachers typically have the least amount of effect on a community because they're moving in to the community. They haven't been a part of the community for years and years, and in some cases, all their life. And so when we look at these things and we think of these things, this is a major misconception. And we must realize that preachers, they are leaders, but they are not the only evangelists. They are to do the work of evangelism as everybody else. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. But that isn't what they are paid for. The second misconception we're going to talk about this morning is that preachers are the visitation team. I'm thankful more recently we've uh, some around here, some of us around here have started uh, working on visitation more. That's a great thing. But in many places, people once again assume that the preacher's there and because uh, he's not clocking in at a certain place, that it is his job to do all the visitation. And this couldn't be further from the truth. 
I even heard one gentleman, believe it or not, use James chapter 1, verse 27, uh, verse 27 to be dealing with preachers only. Now it doesn't, of course. But he quoted that to me when I asked him to go visiting with me. He said, well, isn't that your job? Isn't that what that? James 1.27, isn't that what preachers are paid for? This is a major misconception. Yes, because we don't have a clock in, clock out, there is abilities to visit at different times. And we don't have to do all our visitations at... Uh, evening times or things like that, but that doesn't change the fact that visitation is necessary. It doesn't change the fact that some preachers are going to be better than others. That some people are naturally better at visiting the widows and orphans, visiting those who are sick and ill, better than others. When it comes to preaching, yes, preachers are to visit the widows and orphans. They are to visit members. They are to visit the community. They are to visit the sick. They are to visit all of them, but not because they're preachers, not because they're getting supported from a congregation. That's a misconception. It's because it's the Christian thing to do. The next misconception, if you will, that we're going to look at is that preachers are the workers for the congregation. Now, no one believes that wording in the church. Just like no one believes that just 10% of the members are going to do 100% of the work, even though that's the average of just about every single congregation. When we look at that, no, no one believes this is the case. Preachers are the workers of the church. And what I mean by that is, well, don't we pay them to do the bulletin, to mow the yard, to change the signs, to clean the buildings, and things like that? Don't, isn't that what part of their salary is, is to do all these kinds of things? Thankfully here, there hasn't been much of that. But I've been at places where this was a major contention. We had a brother in the church who wanted to do the bulletin. Was, uh, had, was proficient, as we talked about this morning. Uh, Tom was talking about being proficient in English and things of those things, which you guys have seen the bulletin. I'm, I'm not. He was. He wanted to be involved with that work, wanted to use that to help him in his visitation, wanted to use that in many things, and was told he could not do that work because that's what we pay the preacher for. We talk about and we say things that are hard to hear sometimes, but the reality is there are misconceptions that are out there. I remember several places between where I was and where I'm at here in Ramona and the many different interviews I went on and how many of them I could tell you would lay a sheet of paper in front of me with the title <coughs> Preacher Jobs with none of the, nothing on there saying anything about preaching. It would be a list. I, I One had three pages of what they expected their preacher to do and preaching wasn't anywhere on it. Why? Well, we pay him. All these works that we don't get other people to do, that we have trouble finding people to do, that's the preacher's job. Isn't that what we pay him for? That's a misconception. One can go from Genesis 1 through Revelation 22 and not find any of these things in the Scriptures. They're not scriptural at all, and yet, because we have bought into this denominational ideology that preachers are pastors, using the term as in charge of the whole and congregation and therefore does everything. Because so many in the brotherhood have bought into that, we see these concepts, these misconceptions arise. When I look at this, like I said, it's not, I'm not giving you anything I have not heard before. Some here. Some in other places. We talk about misconceptions. We're talking about things that are challenges that are not biblical and can hinder the preacher's work, can hinder his leadership. Preachers, another misconception is preachers work for the church. And because usually on your on the financial statements it says preacher and it has the word salary there, and we see the, the wording there, we say, 
And you hear this so often, well, preachers work for the local church. They work for the church. That's never been the case. Preachers, it's a major misconception. No preacher has ever, whose worth is salt, who's biblically accurate in any form or fashion, has ever worked for the church. Why is that the case? Because the church isn't perfect. People <laughs> make mistakes. People sin. People believe misconceptions all the time and strive to get the preacher to follow unbiblical things. <clears throat> but the reality is, is preachers in no form or fashion work for the church. They work for God. If they worked for the church, they could not preach in season and out of season because out of season would mean they would have to tickle the ears. It would mean that as the congregation is the boss and they get to tell the preacher what to preach when the preacher knows what they need to hear rather than what they want to hear. When we talk about these things, when we look at these things, when we examine these ideas, we must understand that these are misconceptions that are not biblically founded anywhere throughout the Scripture. So abundantly clear, Paul, where did he receive most of his support? It wasn't typically at the congregation he attended. It was from the congregations he had already been at. When we look at these things and examine these things, preachers are supported. They are paid for a reason, but it doesn't have anything to do with working for the church. It doesn't have anything to do with visitation. It doesn't have anything to do with community evangelism outside of pulpit preaching and proclaiming the gospel therein. It doesn't have anything to do with the bulletin, with the sign, or any of those kinds of things. Those are misconceptions. So what does exactly preachers do? What, what is preacher support for? When one gives of their means and the men in this congregation decide how much is designated for the preacher to support his work. What is the work supposed to be done that he's doing? What is he supported to do? There are only two things in all of the Bible we read that preachers are supported to do. We read first and foremost that they are supported so that they can have the opportunity to study more than the average person when it comes to preaching the gospel. Remember what Paul told Timothy, the local preacher? Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. What is he saying? Timothy, you have to be in the book. That if you're going to preach to the congregation which we'll see in a second that's exactly what Paul is writing about here verse 11 if you're going to Timothy get up in front of a congregation you have to put in the work you have to put in the effort the majority of preachers time in fact is on this I was talking and joking around with my brother over Christmas break and I said the joke that you typically hear of preachers only work on Wednesdays and Sundays. And, and the reality is, though it's a joke, most people actually think that. And my brother, uh, thankfully, he's not ever one to pull any punches with me. And he said, listen, I know that's not necessarily true, but I don't know what you do. <laughs> and I said, well, I've been working on lessons to deal with this. <laughs> I said, but you're, you're like just about everybody else. I, I know you preach on Sundays and, and Bible classes and things like that, but I don't know what you do during the week. I can call you and you can talk and things of this. I, you know, unless you're at a visitation doing something, I don't know what you do. And so I told him, and I, we went to this fashion. I said, "This is what I do." He said, "What do you mean?" I said, "At minimum, and this is if we have the worst week ever. Like I was sick three days this week and barely got to work on much." At a minimum, I'm putting in 10 hours per lesson per Bible class of study. Now, not all that goes into the sermon because that's personal study time too. But that's at a minimum. I want to know the topic forwards and backwards. Doesn't mean I, I will with the depths of scriptures, but a minimum. Typically speaking, I put in at least 15 hours. 
And on the rare occasions where you've heard me say we're going to preach on something else, even though I had something else planned, it took even longer. Why? Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. Preachers are supported so they can get into the book. Does every preacher do that? No. That, that's a reality. Not every preacher does that. In fact, when I, you look at a congregation, you can tell the preachers who do and the preachers who don't. You can see it very quickly. There's a shift, a difference. There's lack of maturity. There's no challenge going on to grow in the Word. You have sermonettes, not sermons. Because they think they work for the church once again and not God. No preacher is worth anything if they are not realizing their support is to get into the Word. Had an old time preacher one time tell me. He said he was at a place and at an interview for a congregational work, and they asked him, he said, How much time do you plan on during the week I'm spending preparing lessons and Bible class? He said, Most of it. <laughs> I said, What do you mean? He said, That's what I'm supported to do. He said, I'm not going to give you a half halfway lesson. I'm not going to not put in the effort. Am I going to do other things and spend much many more hours doing other work? I happen to study at odd hours because of visitation and things like that, that as a Christian and time allowance allowed to sure. You know, I, I was joking around really with myself last night as I uh, realized last night I hadn't done the bullet. <laughs> and at 10.30 last night, I'm in there because I realized being sick, I, I, my schedule was off and I, and I hadn't done it. And so I was in there, it was 10.30, started about 11.30, I got to bed. I started on my iPad as we were watching some TV, me and Kristen, and moved into the, to the office. Just the other day, well, I guess it was a few months ago, I'm getting old now, time flies. I was talking to the local preacher there at Locust Grove, Keith Cable. And he said he'd been up to like four in the morning because he said he had too much to do that day. But he had to get the lesson done for the next day, that Wednesday. See, people don't see those things. They hear, well, maybe he got up at eight o'clock in the morning instead of six. But it's because he was up till four. When we talk about the preacher, his first and foremost responsibility, and the reason he's supported is because his job is to get into the Word and to know it. It's not an arrogance. It's not or shouldn't be boastful in any form or fashion. It's what he's supposed to do. The second thing preachers are supported to do according to the scriptures is to preach the entire whole counsel of God. Paul told Timothy once again, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. In 1 Timothy, again, I mentioned that we'd be going back to that in chapter 4. We looked at verse 16, but notice how he starts that section in verse 11. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity until I come devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. He then goes on, of course, to say how you do that. Study the Word. To save yourself and others. What does all that mean? Well, it means that preachers must preach everything that's in the Bible. And this is where that reality of not preaching for a congregation comes in. Because out of, in season is easy. We, we all know that. In season preaching is easy. But it's the out of season preaching that becomes the most difficult that becomes the most challenged and the hardest. No preacher wants to preach on difficult topics, wants to preach things that they know members within the congregation will not want to hear. No one wants to preach that. 
I've been up all night knowing that type of sermon is going to have to be preached. I've put off sermons unscripturally so, being so nervous knowing what I'm going to have to do. It wasn't right, but I knew it. And it was eating me alive. But as Paul told Timothy, your responsibility isn't to the congregation. You put in all those hours of study not because you want to tickle their ears, but because they need to hear the word. If reprove and rebuke are necessary, they must hear it. If encouragement is needed, they must hear it. And there's not a single preacher who hasn't felt like what I feel is the second most powerful preacher in the New Testament. And that's Paul, have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth. I can only imagine as Paul is being inspired in writing 1 Corinthians, where he is really having to get on to the brethren or Galatians, where he is going to have to really get on to the brethren. As he is writing, as I have no doubt, tears flowing through his eyes, stomach in knots, knowing what he's going to have to say and do, what he's going to have to talk about. Jude didn't want to write about defending the truth from sin and unrighteousness. He wanted to write about the gospel. But he had to. Because those who he was writing to were out of season and needed to hear it. A preacher must always be willing to preach the whole counsel of God. And this means out of season times too. And as a congregation, we must thank him for it. And love him for it. Because it isn't easy, it is a challenge. This also means that preachers must not listen to those that are weaker in the faith or struggling in the maturity of the scriptures and those who want to limit God's word and his proclamation. It's not being callous and it's not being cold. But a preacher must understand when he has those who don't recognize the truth or hearts aren't necessarily in the right place that his job isn't to once again be beholden to people but to God. As Paul told the elders there at Ephesus, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Whether they wanted to hear it or not. And, and trust me, they didn't want to hear what he was saying right then at that time, did they? He was leaving. They were crying. They didn't necessarily want to hear those things. But he told them anyway. Not because he wanted to, but because he had to. I knew a preacher one time who knew 70 different members in, this, in the congregation he was at were in an adulterous relationship and he refused, knowing the truth, refused to preach on it. Why? Because he had had people whom he had studied would say, listen, you'll destroy the congregation if you do this. I think of the souls that were already lost. And we could go on and on. There's a number of things like this we could talk about, examine, and think of, of course. But preachers are supported for two reasons. They're supported by the local congregation, and rightfully so. The laborer is worthy of his hire, Paul told the Corinthians. The preacher is supported. Notice I didn't say necessarily hired, per se, as we think of it today. But a preacher is supported for two reasons to make sure he knows and studies and has the time to do that for his lessons, to present God's word. And with that being said, that doesn't mean he's always going to be right. With all the study that's put in, with all the time that's put in, I've put in hours into study. With the wrong mindset or coming from the wrong perspective, humanly speaking, and come to the wrong conclusion. And I've been thankful and have always said that about this congregation that it does not allow me to preach something that's not right. To say something that is not incoherent, that is not coherent with the scriptures and in harmony with it. As I've said many of times, I've, I've met many of our widow ladies in the back 
They move rather fast when you say something wrong from the pulpit. But that's the best blessing there could ever be. Because truth is what we're after. Righteousness is what we need. And church leaders is what we must have. And preachers are a part of that. They must be humble in it. They must be goal-oriented in it. And they must care about the soul above all else. As we've talked about many a times, the word agape came to mean something more than it originally did, as we see in John 24. Agape means to care for the soul or really above all else. God kind of took that word as he did many others and applied it in a spiritual sense and it means to care for the soul of others. A preacher, an elder, a deacon, they do what they do because of the souls that are at stake. The souls that are in danger and the souls that are righteous. The growth and maturity of every congregation should be, must be at their behest. And if that ever changes, if that ever does not happen, it must not be hidden away. It must be brought to light. Because as I mentioned, the preacher is not doing their job. The congregation is guaranteed to falter. Because everything must work together as it should. This morning, it might be the case that someone's struggling. Someone's dealing with sin in their life, as we all do, but maybe there's someone here who's Sin has caught them more often than they would like to admit, maybe this week or over the last few weeks. As I mentioned, we all have those things we struggle with. We all have sins we succumb to more often than we should or want even. But if that is the case today, if there's someone here who's been struggling in particular, in life, not only me, but the rest of the congregation here, to wrap our arms around you, to encourage you, to strengthen you. Let us do that. As Paul told the brethren to the, of the churches of Galatia, he said, you are struggling, he said, to those that are struggling, you are spiritual help them. Chapter 6 and verse 1. Verse 2, he said, you can go so far as to say, bear that burden with them and fulfill the law of Christ. Why? Because as Jesus said, God and the angels rejoice more over one soul who comes back who's forgiven, who has repented and returned, than the 99 who are solid and righteous. If there is someone here who's struggling in need of repentance, I beg and pray that you pray to God. You ask Him for repentance. That you give your life back to Him if you weren't reading it as you should and allow this congregation to help you. Allow the church here, the family here, to be there for you. If there is someone here who needs the prayers of this congregation, if there's someone here who wants to study the word more in any area, wants to dive deeper into the scriptures in any particular area, let us know. Who wants to grow and mature, let us know. Seek the prayers of this congregation in that endeavor as well. By coming forward as we stand and as we sing.